to do it every week. So we we talk to a thought leader like yourself in the whole international tax and investment migration across border movement space, right? We try to demystify the 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 whole area and importantly look for trends uh, that will help people who listen or who watch what we put out. Uh, put themselves in a position to take advantage of what's going on, right? So that that's pretty much. Uh, for if it is that we do touch on any tax issues, I just want to make the point that we're not here to give advice. We're just having a general conversation about general principles, and whether it's tax or investment migration, you'd probably want to speak to a qualified advisor if you want to work on a plan that is tailor made for you. So again, this is not guidance. This is just general conversation, general principles. So uh, on our website, hg.tax, we have over 2,000 articles that are completely free of charge on, uh, you know, various jurisdictions from a, both a, 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 primarily from a tax point of view because we're tax practitioners. But every once in a while, we do touch on uh, your physical movement of people because that has uh, implications as well. We also do these podcasts, as I said, every week, and we put out content every day on over 20 podcast platforms, including YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, basically wherever you get your podcast, you'll probably hear from us as well. So without further ado, and just welcome, can you please introduce yourself to those who do not already know who you are? Yeah, excellent, Darren. Thanks very much for the invitation. A pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Andre Gutierrez. I'm a senior consultant at Henley & Partners. I'm based in Barcelona. I'm uh, formerly a lawyer back in, uh, in Argentina, where I am from, and, uh, and here in Spain, being a few years in West Migration, and right now in, with Henley since over a year, and uh, very much enjoying all this industry and everything that it has to, to give, to be honest with you. Okay, fantastic. And of course, for those who don't know Henley and Partners is, and, and, and again, I have no, it's just that I have respect for your firm, because it, it's basically the wild, wild west when it comes to the investment migration space. And you guys have set yourself apart as being, you know, just completely above board, completely transparent, and advisor, not just to high net worth individuals, but to governments as well. So I think that's one area in which you, you kind of, definitely different from from the average you you are accredited and recognized on the government websites so you you're not uh, yeah so that 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 i think that's important to, to make that it's quite uh, the, the practice that we have at henley and bar is quite interesting and unique basically mm-hmm. because as you correctly pointed out i mean we focus on advising high net worth individuals in their citizenship and residence planning moves um worldwide you know through 40 offices in more than 35 different jurisdictions uh, but also we have a very, uh, very successful government advisory practice. Uh, at the end of the day, our, um, our chairman, Dr. Chris Kaling, has been the architect of this industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, that has put us in a, in a very special niche with, a, honestly, a, a great in-depth um, information and, and advice and a very clear, in, a, in a very clear and, uh, and transparent and compliant manner at the end of the day, which, uh, as you said, um, in this industry and nowadays it is something that is extremely important. Okay, fantastic. So, you know, there's a lot going on. Basically, the world is open now, more or less, uh, from, from a movement uh, mobility perspective. So in terms of the investment migration space, which jurisdictions are popular? So like if you had to call out five jurisdictions that, that you see renewed interest post-COVID, what would those five be? That's a good question. I believe that mm-hmm. it will be basically on the top of the charts will be Malta and uh, and Portugal. Mm-hmm. It's just basically they are quite top of the charts on, on our ranks. Mm-hmm. Um, Austria's destination, which is very interesting as well. And then obviously you have all the Caribbean plus Spain in, in, in Europe, which makes uh, very interesting combinations on this part of the world. So at the end of the day, what we are seeing is uh, clients are diversifying, not only in one single jurisdiction, but normally in right now, since quite some time, they're getting basically uh, one or two options, a Caribbean passport plus a European residency, or just directly normally, you know, a European passport, a multi-citizenship plus residency somewhere in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, or, or basically around that area, just in case. Also, mm-hmm. Latin America is quite interesting from that saying, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, 
and yeah. given you know the, the pandemic, the Russian Ukraine war, etc., um, clients are looking to diversify the uh, end of the day their their geopolitical insurances what an investment migration plan is so if anything happens in europe where i can go i can go to central america to south america where i go which is safe uh, and i don't have to rely on a three months visa uh, that is something that certainly we are we are looking we are looking at clients doing indeed okay so you but you call out above the rest uh europe and the caribbean right uh is that but isn't that the same as it was before COVID? i mean it was always really about the caribbean passports and golden visas in europe right or is it is there like a nuance is there something different now post COVID? so i mean what we are seeing it is uh i would say still a very Mm -hmm. Quite amount of interest in what is uh, Europe. Uh, Portugal remains top of the chart as it was before. Yeah. Um, I would say that with the pandemic, which is something very interesting that happened here in Spain, it is uh, a very push on the, on the Spanish option. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily for clients interested to move into Spain, uh, mm -hmm. but to have as a plan B because of right, the different yeah. options that you have. At the end of the day in Spain, you can invest not only in real estate, but also you can invest 1 million euros in a structured deposit or uh, mm -hmm. investment funds, which are registered here in Spain. So it makes uh, the diversified financial portfolio mm -hmm. much more simpler and easier and very, very straightforward. So yeah. that is certainly something that we are seeing uh, in terms of Spain, in terms of those nuances. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just uh, just basically, obviously, then the the ultimate solution, as we would we'll like to call it, it is it is multi citizenship. But obviously, you know, it has a longer process. It has a very strict due diligence, very compliant procedures. So mm -hmm. there's there's something always always there for the right person, yeah. the right time. Okay, so in my mind, as a lay person. Uh, the golden visa for Spain and Portugal, they seem to be almost the same. What, what, and you obviously you're closer to this. What distinguishes the the golden visa for each of these two countries, or are they ad identical more or less? It is, it is quite interesting. Yes, they are very similar in the, in the way that, that they work, in the way that the civil law actually works in, in Spain and in Portugal. They have, as you said, certain nuances, and uh, I think that. On the side of Portugal, it is quite interesting the different options that you have in terms of the investment, depending mm -hmm. if you invest in certain areas, mm -hmm. basically you cannot invest in Lisbon, Port or the Algarve, but if you invest, you know, in um, hotel development projects, the investment is slower. It is quite interesting because after those five years passing language tests, you can apply for a Portuguese citizenship, provided that you have stayed in the country those couple of weeks per year and so on, for a couple of years. Um, but one thing that it is unique on the other hand for the Spanish program, it is, um, as we said before, that, that ability to invest in over 4,000 Spanish registered investment funds, uh, which mm -hmm. are, you know, entirely to the disposal of the, mm -hmm. of the investor, uh, mm -hmm. qualify for the golden visa. There is no need at the end of the day um, to, be, to be in the country. And uh, the process itself it is very fast. I mean, once the application has been submitted, it usually would take around 20 working days if the government didn't say anything, but it's very, very fast. It is very, very effective. Um, and also the last feature, which is extraordinarily interesting, it is that for Spain, I mean, it is that for Latin, for Ibero-American uh, citizens, citizens mm. from Ibero-America, including yeah. Dominican Republic, Cuba, Mexico, and the South yeah. Con, Equatorial yeah. Guinea and the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, after two years of effective residency in Spain, they can opt for Spanish nationality. So mm -hmm. it, what we are seeing, it is um, many applicants that they are thinking at the end of the day, the typical thing, you know, on their children, mm -hmm. uh, having the opportunity to be studied, mm -hmm. to study here in, a, in a Spain, um, instead of with a student visa, Mm -hmm. with a golden visa with a residence permit mm -hmm. and after two years they can apply for a spanish citizenship whilst basically mom and dad they keep on running the business you know whatever in the philippines or in mm -hmm. south america that is something that uh, we are seeing um mm -hmm. pretty much and it's quite quite interesting also then the main difference i would say 
besides the financial aspects, it is uh, the real estate market. I mean, the real estate market in Spain as a bigger country, it yeah. is bigger. I mean, you have Madrid, yeah. you have Barcelona, yeah. south of yeah. Spain. Um, basically, interest or yields, basically on the on the on the properties, they are quite interesting. This is still a healthy um, a healthy market, uh, mm -hmm. which is driven by local, uh, mm -hmm. not by foreigners only. So there is a huge demand basically mm -hmm. as well for local actors. Obviously, then you have your European buyers and your golden visa buyers, but it is not the other way around. You don't have your golden visa buyers and then um, your local buyers. So it is a very, very, very interesting option, very interesting way to to look into into Europe indeed. Okay, so, so definitely the, the fund option and the real estate option for Spain is arguably more attractive than Portugal. But at the same time, if you don't come from a, fam a former Spanish colony, so Central South America, uh, the Spanish Caribbean islands, including Puerto Rico, uh, apparently, as well as the Philippines, you would have to wait 10 years. Am I correct? You need to wait. Um, so you need to wait a bit longer for Spain. Yeah. But so therefore, it's more attractive to that that Spanish speaking, uh, that Spanish history, uh, historically Spanish colonies. Uh, it'll be more attractive. However, from a, a, the Portugal point of view, for you know, generally speaking, if you don't come from a, a former Spanish colony, Portugal may be a bit more attractive because you get it after five years rather than ten. But the downside is the if it is you go for the real estate or the fund option, it's it's perhaps less interesting than Spain. So neither is perfect, but you know they would fit different personalities or different family objectives. I, I would imagine, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it, it is it is a question that we get off that we ask very very often, just basically by clients normally from. From the UK, a lot of times, you know, they they have their hoards in Europe. Uh, some of them they are used to being Portugal and Spain. They want to invest, they want to get this and that. Which mm -hmm. one is best? And to be honest with you, it depends on the. There are certain things. Yes, I mean, Portugal sometimes it is slower than Spain, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, we have clients that they are happy to wait. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So it all depends on what the client wants and mm -hmm. to have the correct. Um, the correct, uh, the correct advice. I mean, sometimes clients that just basically, they are not so much worried about the five, six years timeline to, to citizenship, mm -hmm. they are bored. It is with Spain and actually they want to move to Spain. American yeah. citizens, UK citizens, they actually want to relocate and they yeah. need the tax planning to do that. So yes. I mean, to do yeah. the tax lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, some of them just say, no, that's fine. I mean, I want my citizenship in five, six years. Okay, so let's talk about Portugal. It all depends basically on the mid-long term goals of the, mm -hmm. of the client. So it is it is difficult to say what is best because those both options are great. Yeah. What about as you mentioned, Americans? So I, I know Portugal gets hyped a lot in the media in the US, but does yeah. that hype and at least um, the percentage of media headlines, does that resonate with the reality? So are more Americans opting for Portugal over, let's say, Spain or Malta? Yeah, I would say yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. There are more Americans opting for, for Portugal than for Spain, although mm -hmm. there is a lot of interest from U.S. citizens in Spain as well. Um, mm -hmm. I guess that it is due to a lot of different factors that we just mm -hmm. mentioned. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the ability to get the citizenship, it is just basically lower investment. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, they are looking at the NHR as well, you know, mm -hmm. for future possibilities, you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do that combination of Portugal and Caribbean, yeah. and they do, you know, all their things. So mm -hmm. they, are, they are citizenship planning a little bit more... Um, complex, let's put it that way, you know, in terms of their US passport, you know, resigning and all, and all that stuff. But that, it is not my, mm -hmm. not my, my, my ring that is, that is yours there. And that's just, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, well, just kind of stepping back from Spain versus Portugal versus, versus Malta, the EU appears to be, let's say, uncomfortable with investment migration in general. You know, I guess you get that impression how they've treated uh, certain islands in the Pacific or, you know, the way they've been dealing with Cyprus or 
the situation with Malta. What what is your perception? Like, what is the outlook from an EU perspective? Do you think that at some point in time they'll come to some sort of compromise, or do you think the clock is ticking? And in who knows when, but in X number of years, it may not that golden visas or investment migration will disappear, but perhaps it will have a different form. What what are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are basically that the investment migration market brings a lot to the table, basically, yeah. to, to all jurisdictions. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it benefits everyone. It benefits the, the countries that receive the foreign direct investment, to receive mm-hmm. foreign, it um, serves their people, it serves the, the applicant. Um, important thing, it is something that we have seen over the years, it is the increase in due diligence and in compliance. That is something that has been seen, I would say, in all the programs. And it is a very good sign, uh, very, very important. Also very important, the job that the, the IMC does, the Investment Migration Council, on that regard as well. Um, so I think that um, it is true that for whichever reasons, you know, the European Union looks into this, this sort of um, regulations and programs very, very close. At the same time, I think that there's going to be a moment that there's going to be a, an understanding, let's put it that way, because um, at the end of the day, on the matter of the European Union uh, and citizenship by investment within the European Union, um, citizenship is a matter of uh, every particular state. So um, basically, that is a very important point, but also, um, the the checks, due diligence checks, the compliance there on each programs, the uh, compliance that the bank do when they have a, a client, when a client open a bank account, when they invest in a fund, et cetera, et cetera, they are very high as well. Um, and this, at the end of the day, it is a win-win situation for, for all. And it is a, an industry that has stayed, has come to stay at the end of the day. And I don't see, you know, um, going anywhere, but to be honest with you, improving. That improvement will come with conversations with the different stakeholders and improving, you know, the compliance checks, the transparency, the options, and uh, so on and so forth. That is the most important thing, I believe. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, and what about another popular jurisdiction? Definitely. I mean, it was always on the radar, but I think during COVID and now post-COVID, it seems to have a momentum of its own. It's the United Arab Emirates, Dubai in particular. Uh, have you seen any trends or any movement to in, in that direction? I know it's not tech. There's, I mean, technically, it's not a popular investment migration product, but it's a, it seems to be a popular jurisdiction or destination generally. What are your thoughts on that? It has been a very interesting uh, jurisdiction over COVID, as you said, lately as well. Um, we have a very successful office as well, led by, by Philippe Amarante, um, our managing partner there. Um, it has been basically, has driven a lot of investment, not only from the Middle East, but also from, from abroad. Um, different options to, to set up residency as well. Same movement, I would say, from Europe there, it is more difficult, it is more tricky at the end of the day because a European national, European resident for the sake of it, it is used to, to be here. It is normally somewhere that it is sitting on the southern or basically on the eastern part of the world, Southeast Asia, Russia, mm-hmm. that would normally opt to structure something there and then perhaps make the leap or come to Europe, basically, you know, for one or two months. I mean, we have a client which is based in Australia, Thus, you know, stays in uh, Dubai for some time and then comes um, comes here to Europe. Um, but yes, it is certain that it has attracted a lot of foreign direct investment. And I think that uh, from the region in, in Abroad, I think that's 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 a good sign indeed. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just basically those those. That is what I can tell you from this topic, basically from the from the Spanish side. Let's put it that way. Okay, I mean, gotcha. what we have yeah. as well. Uh, sorry, what we see is. Uh-huh. On the other side as well, you know, um, people basically from the Middle East, Dubai, United Arab Emirates, which are obviously looking into south of Spain for many different reasons because yep. they like it, because there's mm-hmm. lifestyle similar mm-hmm. so on and so forth. But that is the other way around, not the way that yeah. you were asking. 
Yeah, yeah. And and you touched on Ukraine and, and Russia, of course. There's an unfortunate situation which we won't comment too much on. But I, I guess that means that for for from an investment migration point of view, perhaps Europe, perhaps the Caribbean is not an attractive destination for them because of the sanctions and stuff like that. But the Emirates has remained open, right? So do you, do you see any, do you, or are you aware of any trends in that space? Uh, of, of course, aside from the Emirates, that people who have been impacted by that whole situation, uh, where are they going and how has that uh, affected the landscape? So basically, if the people affected by the... Um military conflict in Ukraine and Russia have gone a little bit more farther towards down uh, Dubai or what they have been doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically there are there are a few a few options. They have certainly, some of them certainly have gone into, um, into Dubai. Mm-hmm. Um, indeed. Um, there are some options where, which are still open. Basically Montenegro, for example, was open until the program was open for Russians. Um, there are some options in terms of uh, Antigua, sorry, in terms of the of the Caribbean, there is also the option of Grenada. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certain options that they can be looked into on a case by case basis sometimes. There are options around um, around there, but certainly they are in a very tricky situation, a uh, very unfortunate situation, um, mm-hmm. especially those individuals that they weren't thinking about, you know, that something like this. And most of us, including myself, mm-hmm. couldn't even see it, you know, right. that it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, some families that they were thinking five years ago or having a plan B, mm-hmm. uh, they have been able because there are a lot of Russian families that they have their residence cards, Portugal, in Malta, in Spain, because they actually have made their investments apart for the golden visa. They have their second passport. They have been able to, to move, to have that mobility. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them, they're in a much more trickier situation and under much more scrutiny. And mm-hmm. I think that for for difficult and for, for sad that, that, that it is, and with all the empathy in the world, um, it is important that we look into these sort of things as they are, which are geopolitical insurances um, for our families. So in case something happens, one needs to be ready. I think that these to take, I see that with, with, with clients, that they have been able to obtain their residences many years ago. And in the case of, you know, any particular problem that's, that, that, that appeared, they need to move, they moved, you know, with a much more uh, peace of mind. Uh, for others, it was much more difficult. There's always a way that, that it can be found because there's always a way um, legally speaking, I mean, but uh, it certainly gets trickier and trickier. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. You, you mentioned in passing Grenada. So Grenada is still an option for Russians, for people. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So, was, so that's interesting yeah. to know that it's not the entire, all five Caribbean uh, investment, like uh, gold or oh, uh, passport or Citizenship by investment, sorry, that's the term. So not all five have turned their back on people with uh, who were born in Russia. Just one, f- one is available. Okay, so that, that is interesting to know. I want to go back to Dubai. Uh, I know you're not based there, but of course it comes up in conversation a lot. There's a, I've heard people question as to whether their economic, you know, their model is sustainable or is it just, you know, so the pattern of movement to the Emirates, is it a long-term pattern or do you think it's a blip on the radar right now and eventually it will go back to where it was pre-COVID in terms of popularity? What do, you do, do you think it will return to that or do you think this upswing in interest in the Emirates is part of a long-term trend towards the, the Gulf area? That's, that's a very good question, Darren. And... Uh... Honestly speaking, from this optic sitting from here, um, it's difficult to, to look into that without seeing much uh, macroeconomic and trends. But what I've been seeing indeed it is that, as you said, there is, um, there is, there is a growth in the region. The Dubai is getting more and more importance. The real estate market, it is um, basically bigger and bigger. We have 
a very, very important office in, uh, in Dubai as well. Um, it is the, the hub, the business hub of, of the Middle East at the end of the day. So uh, I don't think that this is just basically um, a blip and then it's going to go back. I mm -hmm. think that it's just basically um, a growth, basically a steady growth. I mean, one thing that and it happens, I would believe, in most of the jurisdictions when you talk about the real estate uh, mm -hmm. and what is growing and building and growing and building, is this a bubble or not? Um, yeah. that, that is just basically the, the questions that I've been reading. And it's just like, what is going to happen? But to be honest with you, you have mm -hmm. the same question in certain areas or in Spain here as well, in certain areas of Spain. It's just like up to when the prices are going to go up in the city center of Madrid or in mm -hmm. Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Up to when? Is it a bubble? Is it not? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is very difficult to, uh, to to approach and to answer that, but what I've been seeing is just basically that it is steady, and uh, I think it is good because it nucleates and brings in um, wealth um, and uh, entrepreneurs and uh, mm -hmm. good business minds to the area. And mm -hmm. you know, when one flourishes, mm -hmm. that it is a contagious effect, and that's that's good. Mm, okay, fair enough. Uh, moving from Emirates to another popular jurisdiction, Malta. Uh, we, we know that there's a, a legal matter being, uh, I guess, litigated right now. What is your sense? I know you, nobody has a crystal ball, but, you know, given that you're European and you have a legal background, what, what are your initial thoughts? Uh, and again, nobody's holding you to any predictions, but what are your thoughts as to how this matter would unfold? It is, I mean, it's a very, very interesting case and it's yeah. uh, a very interesting thing. I mean, I believe that basically on one side, every country has its own right to decide who is going to be a citizen on, mm -hmm. on, on legal grounds. Um, it is understandable as well that the European Union in some way wants to make sure that, you know, the, the, the people that are going to be granted citizenship of, are of uh, um, of good standards, which is actually what the, the Maltese authorities do. They have, I would believe it is the, and I believe it is the, the strictest compliance uh, process in terms of, of citizenship. It is very, very hard, to be honest with you. I work not only here in Henley, but, but in another Maltese company as well. It is very, very hard. It's very, very strict. Um, and it is the most successful, if not one of the most successful citizenship by investment regulations worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, but coming to, uh, to your question, so at the end of the day, what I believe it is that um, there is going to be, in terms of the result, Malta has a very strong case uh, under, um, under its, its arm uh, for certain. The result of that, who knows what can happen, but uh, we always expect they, they are positive um, for the whole market, not, not only for Malta, for the whole investment migration market. And for that, I mean, all the stakeholders, including the European Union, because at the end of the day, these programs, they bring a huge load of foreign direct investment. They bring, um, you know, just basically prosperity in terms of um, the money, the contributions um, give to the national funds that allows to build roads, to build schools, to build shelters or different NGOs uh, activities that they can do. Um, it helps as well to bring nationals from another jurisdictions which are already successful entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and they can fall in love with the country and then move there and pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that it is a win-to-win -win situation. Um, yeah. Important thing, it is uh, compliance procedures. I think that, you know, we all hope that it is going to come into a, into a good decision for everyone. Mm -hmm. But right now, sure. we have to wait and see. Okay, understood, wait and see. So yes, there, there are definitely benefits. But on the flip side, I mean, the EU has made it clear they don't like it. They they. They grabbed the ex any excuse available, like for what we saw with Cyprus, Montenegro, and there's the there's the argument that you are, you know, people are being yes, they get citizenship for let's say Malta or Portugal, 
but they don't stay there. Malta is pretty tiny, right? So they use it as a, a like a gateway into to the European Union, and particularly if they come through the uh, like a golden visa route where there's minimum or no residency requirement. They don't necessarily have that connection to the country, to Europe. So I, I guess I, I can see the, the the different perspectives. And on the back of that, in December, the, one of the uh, the senior government officials in Portugal, he made some comments that were, I mean, they were suitably vague about reviewing the Golden Visa program, but people somehow interpreted that uh, in, a, in a negative rather than a positive way. So I'm asking two things. What are, what are your interpretations of, of the sentiment coming from Portugal and whether there are, ser- there are similar reflections on the part of the government in Spain? as well. Perfect, excellent. I mean, on that, basically, we'd like to to go back into something that, that, that you touch base in terms of the genuine links, you know, with a future citizen and the, and the country. At the end of the day, um, those genuine links, you know, in terms of more that they are basically given because not only the applicant is making its contribution to the, to the government, to the then donations to NGOs, but also he has um, his uh, residence there, he stays in Malta for, for some time. And also, once he's given citizens, he's subject to uh, compliance during the next five years, which mm. is something that no other jurisdiction does it. Um, the next five years, he has to be subject to compliance. Uh, that is revised by the by Comunita Malta um, before the IAP agency. And, um, and yes, just basically, it's very... All those sort of things are checks and balances that that helps uh, that helps in that. So, um, going sorry, to, that, that's an interesting point. I wasn't aware of that. Could you talk a bit about the compliance that you have to abide by for five years? What exactly does one need to do? No, it's it's fine. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. once you get once you are a citizen of Malta, you have every year you have to submit a compliance pack, which is basically um, a couple of forms declaring to the to the government where you're a tax resident and. Uh, that you still have, you know, or you're in compliance with the uh, Maltese regulations that give you mm. the right to be citizen, basically, you know, mm. having the property, uh, either purchase of over the minimum threshold of 750,000 or rented for mm. over 18 or whatever it is, it is in, in the particular mm. case. Okay. Um, that needs to be done basically on, on a yearly basis. The government does its own compliance, you know, on the, on the applicant. And that is done for five years. So there is this is a regular, you know, follow up on the applicants to ensure that they are, you know, proper proper Maltese. They don't do it just basically for for anything. Anything happens at the end of the day, you never know what is going to happen in the future. So yeah. that is a safeguard at the end of the day, which which is also important. It's also interesting. Um, that's why I mean, in terms of compliance from Malta, it is. The country that has the highest level of compliance and uh, it helps you know to balance out you know mm-hmm. that's that sort of things so also their compliance procedure is top top notch in the sense that the client needs to disclose absolutely everything you know in terms of his assets and several different things but uh, so it's a very clear and transparent program um in terms of uh, of portugal and spain i mean you mentioned that back in december mm-hmm. yes that's uh, that's correct um, but after that, there were no no changes of heart. Let's put it that way. You know, I mean, the, the Portuguese program remains open, remains strong, remains steady. Um, it was a little bit of, um, yeah, just basically, how would you call it? Um, fear. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Suddenly, from one way to the other. Yeah. But uh, but no, it's basically that stays there, remains remains there as well. The same thing that in Spain, in Spain there are no news that it is going to close or not. Right? It's just basically, in fact, right now in December there are a few things that have been modified for the good. So basically, the first residence card last year was issued for two years. This year is sure for three years, and that is renewed for yeah. five years. So there are very little things, but mm-hmm. actually. They they show that you know the government is looking to to keep on it uh, to keep with it. The Spanish program works very very well. The Spanish government is very efficient. Once the application has been submitted, you have decisions very quick, very fast. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
So, so yes, I mean, I don't see those those two programs going going anywhere. Okay, understood. Now, I'm, I'm going to shift a little bit uh, to to the east, Cyprus. Uh, I, I saw somewhere in the headlines. I think it was last month. So we, we for those who are listening, we're having this conversation in February 2023. So when I say last month, I mean January. There was some headline about over 200 passports were or citizenships were revoked from Cyprus. I think it was. Uh, do you have any insight or any comments on that? And should that be should should one be concerned about that? Well, I mean, I don't have much to comment there on, to be honest with you. If uh, the Cyprus authorities basically decided to, to revoke those passports, it was basically because probably some rule of law wasn't followed at the time yeah. that, was, uh, that was issued. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it is, if that's the case, which should be the case, um, yeah. it is something that one would say, why? But at the same time, if the rule of law wasn't followed, they are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So it is writing a wrong at the end of the day, mm -hmm. but it is it, it is perhaps a sad but a good notice for the for the for the for the audience in general. I would I would say. Okay, good. Uh, earlier, we, you touched on just in passing Latin America. So, so Latin America isn't really known for any golden visa, any investment migration programs, but it, what's going on there? What are the options? What are the opportunities to look at there? Well, Latin America is very interesting jurisdictions. It has very interesting jurisdictions. I mean, I'm originally from there, originally from Argentina. It is for certain for certain things it is interesting. For certain things it is not interesting. Okay. Uh, it is, uh, but it is good. I mean, there are certain places which are safe, which are politically stable, um, which are interesting indeed. Uruguay it is one at the end of the day. Uruguay has uh, an interesting tax residence program. It's more than likely you're aware. Um, Uruguay as a country is a very good and safe harbor. It is always being reputed as the, the Switzerland of, of Latin America or the Monaco of Latin America since, since I am a child. Mm -hmm. um, basically because being, being safe, being politically stable, um, it was basically where normally, you know, um, how would you call it, so wealth from the region would go, um, not only for, for holidays, but also for investment. So um, it is good, a good place to, uh, to go, a good place to be. Um, basically, after that, South America is not recognized for having many different options in terms of residency by investment. Mm -hmm. Panama has a couple of, actually has quite a few options need, but for certain things that have happened in the past, Panama has, has best name out there, um, you know, it is, um, it is still, still tricky. So, so yeah, I mean, it is a very interesting jurisdiction to, to explore Latin America. What we see it is basically, you know, typically Brazilians, you know, that uh, they want to acquire residence permit in Portugal and apply for the golden visa because they cannot do it by ancestry. Same thing that happens with the rest of Latin America with Spain. Um, you know, and it's just basically that is the type of movement that we see. Mm -hmm. um, see, historically, Latin America, I always said, uh, said in an interview, I remember a few years ago, I mean, whilst, whilst Argentina, so Latin Americans, um, they used to look up basically to Miami and yeah. to South America. Now, Americans are looking into Europe, basically. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it is, it is a very common trend in Latin America, you know, that Latins you look into making investment in Miami, New York, studying yeah. Harvard, etc., always north. Even yeah. though basically we have, you know, citizenship by descent from, from Europe because 40, 40 percent, you know, we have European inheritance. Uh, but then it's just like we end up looking there and then Americans, they are just basically looking the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, but but you also have your good share of uh, yeah. Latin Americans, which are just basically making the diagonal and crossing the Atlantic. Right. And so let's let's go back to to Panama and Uruguay. So Panama, I guess it's an interesting case study in a jurisdiction and, and the idea that a jurisdiction can have its moment in the sun and then not be as popular uh, going forward. Right. So you know that would be an interesting case study, as you mentioned. 
there have been some, you know, some issues which we probably don't need to get into. But Uruguay, it's it, is it is it on the up is it on the ascent? Is it up and coming, or is it it's been pretty steady as you said since you were a kid? It was a, a popular jurisdiction, and it's just been consistent. So is it consistency or is it growth? And regardless of which one it is, could you tell us like how do you get to Uruguay? What how does the program work? Yeah, so basically, I mean. What I would say about you, why it is consistency. It is. Uh, it always had that that feeling, and that uh, it's always been like that. Uh, political stable, good economy, um, small country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so basically, I mean, very briefly speaking, um, details we can we can discuss them later. But at the end of the day. What UI has is a tax residence program rather than uh, rather than anything. It really need, it needs. Uh, a real estate investment of around uh, 350,000 euros approximately. So, stack number will need to double check. Um, and then it requires the applicant to stay uh, around 60 days in the country. Um, then it has quite a lot of different tax benefits that, uh, from a tax structure and perspective, can be quite interesting too. Um, and it is uh, it is quite quite an interesting jurisdiction. And to be honest with you, with all the turmoil that has been in the neighboring countries, call it Argentina, call it Brazil, call it Peru. A um, lot of different, you know, high different individuals from the regions, they go there because they don't have to go to Spain and run their business from Spain. No, they just, they go to Uruguay and they run their business from Uruguay an hour and a half by plane to somewhere else, you know? So it is, uh, it has attracted a lot of attention in the past two or three years from there, from the region. Okay, understood. Okay, so it's more of a, a tax residency play as opposed to uh, uh, an investment. So an investment migration. So I want to get a passport. I, I want citizenship. So okay, I got you. Yeah, correct, correct. You would look at it like perhaps you look into Gibraltar or perhaps you look into another brand that has a very strong component. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I, I'm happy to stay there for 60, 80, 90 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to have a taxation effect apart from having, you know, the possibility of having your residence in the country and eventually citizenship after X amount of years if if they qualify. Um, but there is no formal citizenship by investment program or anything like that. Okay, understood. So I'm just picking up uh, another question from the chat box below. Uh, someone is asking, I'm sorry if you've already touched on the Caribbean, but I'd like to hear your opinion on trends and the possible future of uh, investment migration programs from the Dominican Republic. Any, any comments? Interesting. So, I mean, um, in terms of the Caribbean, basically, as we know, we have the, the five, different, five different countries. They are always evolving and uh, which I think it is good and always improving. Um, so basically, trends in the possible future of mass migration in the, in the region of the Dominican Republic. Uh, Dominican Republic has a very interesting or has an interesting um, residence by investment program, um, basically by which you invest two hundred thousand dollars in uh, in property, and after you know passing your checks and so on, you can um, be granted with a uh, with residency. Um, in terms of uh, of trends uh, on the region, I think that are going to keep and maintain to be stable. I think that. Perhaps 10 years ago, it was something that people would go just for that. And right now, we have a lot of people that they do it in combination with something. It has mm -hmm. been a very interesting tool to have in your belt, combined with another program, basically, mm -hmm. combined with the European residency or including multi-citizenship. At the end of the day, um, there are many families, um, wealthy families, that what they are looking into it is to diversify their possibilities in case something happens. I mean, I always remember mm -hmm. um, a client that I had in the past that basically he had his uh, second or third res residence in the, in the Caribbean. He was in the Caribbean national, but he had a second or third residence in the Caribbean. And during the pandemic, he spent two or three months there. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's just basically it's better to be there than, you know, better to be somewhere else you know in your house even if it is even if it is nice just outside you can be outside you know and so on and so forth so um i think that people are starting to look into that way that sort of diversification um and when you have a i didn't have a budget of um one or two million euros to invest in property um in europe or in a um, citizenship in malta or whatever it is the the other cost 
for a for a Caribbean citizenship mm -hmm. compared to the European residency or citizenship, it is fractional. And the benefits that they can give, they are much higher because mm -hmm. it gives you the possibility of if something happens, you go there, you have the alternative passport citizenship. Um, I mean, having two or three passports, it is, you know, it is, it is always good. I mean, when you are traveling, you have to apply for visas. Um, you want to go to certain countries, you need to apply for a visa. For certain nationals, it takes longer. For mm -hmm. other nationals, it takes shorter. Mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes it is that sort of things, you know. Um, it is um, it is that. So I think it is, uh, it is something that is a really good combination for many, many, many clients. Yeah. For the other ones, it is um, a first asset to, to have. Mm -hmm. So that's a great pairing, uh, ca Caribbean citizenship plus European residency, because yeah, yeah. yeah it is it is something that I always I always like because at the end of the day, for a, someone that has been born, you know, in a country with has no many visa free access, call it North Africa, call it Nigeria, call it Pakistan, mm -hmm. um, basically. What it could do is basically first apply for a Caribbean citizenship in three, four, six months, have his passport, be able to travel visa free. In the meantime, he can look at doing the investment in Europe. Whatever country he chooses can be Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. It matters that it fits his goals. Mm -hmm. um, and that way he can diversify the investment within Europe and then just basically have a safe harbor to be in Europe with his family and at the same time during that time that he does not have the residence car being able to to travel freely or do it one after the other so it is a great tool to have in combination uh but it also it is a great tool for those people that they don't want to are not able to um make this sort of diversification someone that is from north africa from nigeria from africa in general um, from uh, from Pakistan, from uh, many different jurisdictions that they do not have that visa-free access mobility and they actually, they need to travel for business basically mm -hmm. and they need to keep on requesting visas here and there. Uh, that is complicated uh, to run a business like that, a global business. So sometimes for those clients, it will be just one solution. Um, it all depends on the, on the background, but what I'm seeing certainly it is that diversification in terms of a package, basically. Okay, understood. And the last question is about another island, Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. I, I know they've had some challenges recently, but I, I think they may be on the road to addressing some of it. Could you comment on what's going on with Vanuatu just generally? Yeah, I mean, the last news that I have about Vanuatu is that obviously they have the... Um, how do you call it? The, the European Union basically took, took out all their visa freeze and, yeah. and stuff. And right now, the last news that I have about that country is that Vanuatu was, was going to involve how on, I don't know, and, and that is not, not, not part of my role to, to know it, yeah. was going to involve the European Union, you know, to, to see the improvements on that. But more than that, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. Uh, one thing that I do know is that any sort of improvement that it is done to any investment migration program that become that makes it to be robust, that makes it to be compliant, that makes it to be transparent, that makes it to be just basically fully on board with all the regular compliance requirements that we have in any other industry, it is uh, in our industry, of course. It is something which is very good and welcome because when one is uh, strong, the rest were strong as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we have to wait and see. I think that European Union gave 18 months to Vanuatu, um, 12 or 18 months, can I remember right now? And then we have to wait and see what, what happens there. Okay. So, uh, it is just, just basically that. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Andres. Appreciate you sharing your time and your insights as to what's going on. Now, if someone wants to follow up on any of these programs, what's the best way to reach you? Best way to reach me it is normally on my email. Uh, my email is name and surname Andres Gutierrez at henleyglobal.com uh, or on my on my mobile that we can share it later. But normally, email it is the best way to do it. LinkedIn. As well, you can find me there as, as usual. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Devin. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. And off. Okay, we're all done. So.